yeah, we'll see how it plays out. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with like, I don't know, just kind of going with the flow yeah. and seeing what happens. I don't have yeah. a strict plan, but um, yeah. I got nightmares in my head. I feel thoughts build up until I can't feel. My mind fills up into a creature, and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I feel. Thoughts build up until I can't hear That my mind fills up into a creature And it haunts me somewhere much deeper Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science The most authentic voice in true crime Well, we've just heard the voice of Mo Wilson That was from July 2021 Somewhere around San Diego and I can't help when I see her, when you hear her speak, remembering how Caitlin Cash quoted her, quoted her saying, if we're not willing to risk catastrophic failure, we're probably not basically living our lives to the full. And she also mentioned in part of that sentence, you know, if we're not willing to risk catastrophic failure, we're probably not loving the right way. In other words, you should give everything, I guess. And I think it's okay in a sense to think that way, to be very committed and to be all in. The problem, I think, with a philosophy like that is you getting your fairy tale may be opening someone else up to a, a new nightmare. And on the other side of it, you getting what you want might be someone else's catastrophic failure. And you may be willing to experience catastrophic failure, but maybe they will be they will go to every length to prevent that. And so I think it is okay to take risks in one's life as long as you are the only one who pays. Now it might sound like I'm saying Caitlin's I'm sort of normalizing her response and I'm not doing that at all. It might sound like I'm rationalizing something like, oh, someone might be seeing my boyfriend, I'm going to kill them. I'm certainly not doing that at all. I'm simply trying to provide a balanced view here. And this is really the final episode, the final analysis on this story, a story that actually drew me all the way from South Africa to Austin, Texas. And it really wasn't easy to get there. I had COVID. Texas was really quite a long way out of the way, given my existing itinerary. So what regarding this particular story hasn't been said? Well, I think there is a very important fragment, and that is the day after, right? And I'm, when I say the day after, I don't necessarily mean um, the first day, but actually the second day. It's the second day after the incident. In other words, May 13. What actually happened on that day? And I hope providing this last piece of the puzzle is going to help some of you try and understand to some extent what actually happened. I'm not trying, again, trying to rationalize it, but give a sense of what was really going on, because so little of those dynamics were really revealed in court. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Incidentally, if you found the relationship dynamics in this case quite interesting, you might find my coverage of the Karen Reed case also interesting because it's really a question of are relationship dynamics an explanation for what happened in that case or did something else fairly random take place? Same kind of scenario. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So when the 24-hour mark was approaching, since Mo Wilson's murder, effectively, um, that whole day had passed. You know, was Colin Strickland seeing any red flags then? You know, after 24 hours, are you starting to get an intuitive sense of what is going on, that, that something is seriously wrong? And I mean, he does have added information. Not only does he know Mo Wilson has been murdered, but by now the cops have confronted him, spoken to him, asked him about his movements, asked him about, you know, did you buy any guns? Do you have any guns, etc. And it was also put out there that Caitlin's vehicle was spotted in the area. That was really the 
elephant in the room, essentially. That, that was the thing that the cops needed to um, put onto Colin's radar. And so how did Colin deal with this elephant that is now part of the whole um, scheme of things? And of course, her vehicle had been spotted in the area because it was in the area for over an hour. It wasn't like it just came and went and it was in the fabric and out of the fabric. And so this then raises this question, how do you think Colin responded to this information as early as day one uh, of the authorities basically saying, you know, what, uh, we saw Caitlin's vehicle. And then how do you think Caitlin reacted knowing that the cops knew as much as they knew and now so did her boyfriend? Well, predictably, what should have been a brain melting what the if was simply met with disbelief. It can't be. It can't be her vehicle. It can't be Caitlin. It doesn't make any sense. And obviously, by thinking that way, Colin has no idea that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Caitlin has been following them online, following them on his phone. And, and that is something that he did know. He did know that she basically went onto Colin's phone and removed... Uh, her contact details, most contact details, prompting him to change her name. So he knew about that. And so you would imagine that he, that this would be intuitively logical. And yet, can you see to what extent he was in denial? So when Strickland returned home that evening, now it's 24 hours have gone by, and we're going to deal with the next day in a moment. But he returns home, he's been speaking to the, the cops for much of the day, and he finds her deeply shaken. That cool exterior has now kind of been penetrated. And according to the writer from, from that Outside Online article, Ian Dill, she resembled someone who'd been, quote, sucked into a bizarre, awful tragedy. And it actually feels the other way around, that Mo had been sucked into a bizarre, awful tragedy. And that someone who should have known better perhaps could have been Colin. Someone who could have gotten out of that suction could have been Caitlin to say, I don't really be part of this. And in any event, both of them are actually in shock. Even though Mo's the one that's killed and Caitlin was, was in severe shock, this couple are kind of in shock themselves, and they, they're not saying anything. They don't even speak to each other at all in the beginning. According to the article, finally Armstrong told him that the police had searched the house and had taken her in for questioning as well. Well, th they had taken him in for questioning. They had taken her in for questioning. I guess it didn't mean anything, did it? That, that would maybe be how he was thinking about it. Also, now that she knew where he really was, right, where he really was, wasn't she pissed off? Wasn't she pissed off that um, he'd lied to her? And, and I'm not really talking about this from her perspective, but from his perspective being now aware of her perspective. Why aren't you pissed off? No, she was really pretty cool about it. But she was also frightened. Why is she frightened? And is she more frightened than what he is? And should she be? And so she literally said to Colin, I'm really scared. What should I do? Strickland said, according to the article, that he thought that from a criminal perspective, so this is Colin playing at the whole true crime psychology, saying from a criminal perspective, they didn't have anything to worry about. Boy, was he wrong. He had a, a lot to worry about and, and she had even more to worry about. The, the shit show is just about to begin. And so he said they just needed to document where they were and what they had been doing and to write it down before they forgot any details. Later, they lay in bed, according to the article, trying without success to fall asleep. And so even if they were consciously blocking it all out, consciously rationalizing, minimizing, um, the, the subconscious was basically nagging at them, saying... Hello, I, th I think you, you need to deal with this. I think there's something more here. Armstrong apparently said to Colin, I just miss my mom. 
I want to go to Michigan. I want to hug my mom. Now, it's interesting that at this point she gravitates to her mother and not to her father. It also shows to some extent an infantile response here. In a very serious situation, she wants mommy. And I, I think it shows to some extent Armstrong may have individuated. She may have become an adult in a certain sense in terms of making a living, uh, accumulating a certain amount of money, uh, finding a partner, uh, finding a home, making a life for herself. But I think in another sense, perhaps in an emotional sense and in a deeply psychological sense, she was still a little girl in a sense. She was still someone who needed a protective figure around her and perhaps she wanted or needed that figure to be a... a um, well, she, she wanted that figure to be a strong boyfriend and she wanted a perhaps a, a father figure or even a mother figure in her husband or in her boyfriend. And you could just kind of get a sense that she needed she how much she needed a protective figure and was Colin that. And and so I think you can get a sense of just how stinging and painful and anguishing that, that exquisite pain of Colin's betrayal would have felt to a person like that, a person who seems strong but is actually um, putting up a front to hide just how fragile and vulnerable they are because they are, in a sense, a little girl that has never really grown up, a little girl that has played mother to those around her but was never really allowed to be a little girl herself. And so even she, even though she knows what she did, is saying it can't be. The next morning, Armstrong wanted to talk more with Strickland about what had happened, but she was worried that the police might have bugged the house. So they decided to head to a nearby coffee shop. And I think what this, and that's again from the article, I think what this shows is distrust of law enforcement verging on paranoia. And if Strickland agreed with Caitlin, then he likely felt the cops had an agenda and they wanted to frame someone and they were just desperate to solve this case and they were going to just grab at straws. You know, if they couldn't find anyone, then they were going to try and um, pin it on him. And I guess he felt that they didn't have any facts that led to anyone specific. I suppose they could have shown him the surveillance footage and then would he have come out of his denials? I guess a good question. Of course, believing in conspiracies is just another version of being in denial about your own reality. And I think if you believe in a lot of conspiracies, if you Google something that you believe and Google records it as, as a conspiracy, it might not be. But if, you, if there are lots of things that you believe that are regarded, let's say, officially as conspiracies, you may be in denial about your own reality. You may not be very good at dealing with events in your own life. Do you think conspiracies are making that any easier? It feels like it's easier because it's simple solutions. But if you can't deal with your own reality, your own personal reality, how good are you going to be dealing at realities that are out there and vice versa? And so this was an example of that. Caitlin's vehicle in the area, could it be true? No, it can't be. Well, how can it not be true? I don't want it to be true, so how can I, how can it not be true? And so he thought, well, maybe the cops were mistaken. Maybe they were deliberately lying. Maybe they were trying to trick him. It can't be. Well, it was none of those things. According to Outside Online, when the couple walked outside, when they were in the front yard, they found that someone had tipped over Strickland's motorcycle, which was parked next to Armstrong's Jeep, the same Jeep that she drove to the crime scene and drove back from the crime scene. In addition, the top layer of a dry stacked limestone wall in front of the house had been knocked over and strewn across the sidewalk. Now, that might seem... Weird, but it could also just be a simple explanation that Strickland's motorcycle had simply fallen over by itself. Okay, well, then how do you explain the wall? Well, how about someone had come to take a look at Armstrong's Jeep, either a passerby or an investigator or someone from the media, and while they were skulking around, 
and they're there because of the news of what's happened. They accidentally kicked over the motorcycle, and then in their rush to kind of get out of there, um, jumped onto this limestone wall and knocked part of it down. Or it could be vandalism, but I don't think it was random vandalism. Still, this incident was part of the psychology that made them think that some sort of scheme was underway involving shadowy figures that they couldn't see. Well, actually, the only shadowy figure here was Caitlin. And if you think about Colin's denial, you know, about Caitlin, knowing everything he knew about Caitlin, he was still in a kind of denial that she could have been involved, and she was involved. I think is a similar kind of denial to his own involvement, to the his own um, his own role in this whole case, where he bought the firearms, he knew what was going on with Caitlin, and he wasn't being clear with either of them on what his intentions were, and you don't really hear him acknowledging that. We've got to kind of acknowledge that for him. In any event, we are now at day two, and they are now at a coffee shop sitting in silence. And eventually Strickland asked Armstrong, according to this article, to describe where she'd been and what she'd done on Wednesday. Let's get this straight. It's only on Friday morning, not Thursday morning, not Thursday night, that Colin asked her for the first time where she was. Wouldn't you... Wouldn't that be the first thing that you would want to know? Do you get a sense that Colin doesn't really like dealing with things and he postpones or procrastinates? And so how did Caitlin answer? Caitlin said she'd gone to a yoga class and then to a waxing appointment in South Austin. In other words, she was saying, I wasn't anywhere in the area, and the area was East Austin. Had she gone to a yoga class? Well, it would be easy enough to confirm if she had and when she was done with all that. According to the article, Strickland thought, why did the police believe that her vehicle had been in East Austin? And now, at this point, he's starting to entertain the possibility that maybe it was her vehicle. So what explanation could be there be for that? His mind raced. He knew Armstrong was into astrology. Maybe she'd gone to see an energy worker on the east side, again, according to the article. Now, I think Armstrong being into astrology and yoga kind of also shows someone who is trying to deal with reality, but are they doing it in a very constructive way? Up until then, was it working for her the way that she was dealing with her life? Dealing with it through yoga and astrology and ultimately killing someone that was getting in her way. And then at the end of all of that, I miss mommy. Was that the right way of dealing with things? And so he wondered, could she have gone to see an energy work on the east side, but she didn't tell him about that. And bear in mind what he said, I went to give someone flowers, which is kind of a code name for cannabis. And if there's a reason to distrust law enforcement, it is if you're using cannabis at home in a state where that's not legal. But then is it really right to distrust law enforcement? You know, it's, it's not as though law enforcement are wrong if they are coming after you. They are just doing their jobs. And so in terms of investigating this murder, weren't they just doing their jobs? And so... Again, he, he was struck with this thing of it can't be. She couldn't. It didn't seem possible. And according to the writer of this article, anything seemed more possible than Armstrong killing Wilson. And I totally agree with that, that that wouldn't be your first thought. It certainly wouldn't be your first thought. And yet on some level, he wonders whether Caitlin isn't telling him everything. But it seems rather than have her explain, Colin tries to work it out in his own mind. According to the article, after finishing their coffee, Strickland and Armstrong walked back to the house. The police had taken their phones. Armstrong asked Strickland, what should I do? Should I, where do I get a phone? And so he suggested she pick up a temporary phone at Walmart. Armstrong left around 10.30 a.m., little knowing that she would never really see him again. And obviously he wouldn't see her again. And in her absence, she's just gone to Walmart to get a phone. 
his lawyer, and I guess her lawyer as well, suggested that they separate for a while. And so while Armstrong goes to Walmart, Strickland went to his father's house. Now, it's interesting that their lawyers seem to know what is better for them than they did themselves, especially Colin. If you think about it, if they didn't separate, if they came home that night, what would have happened? Would Colin have uh, turned Caitlin in? Would Caitlin have turned on Colin? What would have happened? Would Caitlin have confessed to Colin and would they have both gone on the run? Or would he have covered for her? What would have happened? One explanation for all this is that we are dealing with individuals that in a certain sense are driven and assertive and successful, yet that's not the whole sum of who they are. There's another side to them that is less strong, less sure, less secure, um, in, in a sense, in um, denial and, and naive, in another sense. So in, in one sense, um, superstars, like he's a superstar on the bike, she's an expert in real estate and to some extent investments, and yet extremely naive in kind of an, an emotional sense. I also think the fact that Caitlin got $6,350 worth of plastic surgery, I, I don't think that was just camouflage. I don't think it was um, f just for obvious reasons. I wonder whether it doesn't reveal a lot more about Caitlin's psychology, that she was becoming insecure about her age and about her looks, and that uh, plastic surgery wasn't just about evading law enforcement. It was dealing with something that was actually bothering her, her appearance. Because the surgery wasn't just on her nose. It also included a brow lift and possibly removing wrinkles around her eyes. And now a final thought. One of Caitlin's parents was an alcoholic. And if she was conceived while a parent was consuming alcohol, it's possible this may have manifested in a syndrome. Now, I'm not trying to blame a syndrome for Moe's murder, far from it. I'm simply trying to join the last dot. And someone mentioned this, and I couldn't help thinking that that does resonate with the some of the circumstances in this case. Fecal alcohol syndrome can damage the brain in very specific ways, including problems with impulse control. And it, isn't that what happened in this case that led to Mo Wilson's murder? Just that. Someone who couldn't control an impulse. Difficulty with reasoning and problem solving. Who on earth confronted with these problems tries to solve it in the way that Caitlin did? Trouble adapting to change. Difficulty identifying consequences of choices. And just in this aftermath narrative, you, you get the sense that she can't seem to understand the off, she can't seem to understand what the consequences of what's just happened. And they are totally obvious to many of us, but she simply can't it's very difficult for her to see it. Also, poor judgment skills. If there's a case that is about poor judgment perhaps more than any other, it's this one, where not only does she destroy someone else's life and the life that she's trying to, the lifestyle that she's trying to protect, but she instantly destroys that. She destroys her boyfriend's life, the guy that I guess she loves, destroys her own life, all just like that, and the case is kind of solved almost immediately as well. And then the final factor that's, supposedly associated with fecal alcohol syndrome, is stubbornness. We just stubbornly insist on trying to follow a particular path in life when life is saying, no, not this way. The average person who might have found themselves in Caitlin's situation may have also felt feelings of anger and frustration towards Mo. No one's saying that, that, that that's not normal. But if someone came up to a person like that, handed them a gun and said, okay, problem solved, here's your solution, most people, hopefully, would quickly imagine the obvious consequences, that there'd be an investigation, that what they were doing was wrong, that there was maybe another way of solving this 
the, the, the simplest one, if you're thinking about committing a murder, maybe you're not with the right person. Why is this person that you're with choosing not to be with you and being dishonest and so on? Maybe you, there's a, a better person for you. Maybe you need to be in a different situation. And maybe it's going to be difficult to get out of that situation, but it's going to be less difficult than committing a murder and trying to uh, get away with that. Of course, if that's not what the average person imagined, just to be clear, that is what happened. That she committed murder and she was caught and not only was it real, it should have been foreseeable. So why wasn't it? Well, I suspect that every successive phase after gunning Mo down, especially when in court with her lawyers arguing scenarios for her, and also before the jury came out, and then when the jury did come out, I fully suspect, and bear in mind I was in court, I was also one of those people looking at the back and side of Caitlin's head. The, the thought bubble percolating out of Caitlin's ear was, it can't be. Well, no, it can be. It is. This is consequence. Sometimes our worst enemies aren't Mo Wilson or Colin or our parents or alcohol syndrome. It's ourselves. It's us. We standing in the way and we're not getting the signal that life is sending saying, this is what's happening and it's not working out for you. Take a different path. But then you stubbornly refuse to see the world the way it is and insist on the world seeing us and, and it the way we want it to be seen. And then the world simply doesn't. One person can't force the world to be something else. What one person can do is learn to adapt and be more effective at working with what the world has to offer and what you have to offer. And instead of repeatedly running to it can't be's, you know, occupying the real world, uh, being, being fluid, being in the real world, being flexible, but also being resilient and capable of growth. You know, trees and plants kind of have it engineered into their DNA that they can lose leaves and lose branches and lose a certain amount of themselves and then continue growing. You know, you have that part of plants that, you know, you have animals that feed on plants like giraffes and, and certain browsers. And so plants can give up a certain amount of their own structure, you know, the, the, a corporeal part of themselves they're willing to lose because they feel that is part of life. And what they then realize is there's, you know, there, there are going to be other summers. There's going to be other spring times. There's going to be other opportunities to develop other parts of themselves and overall and cumulatively grow and, and have a certain amount of abundance, certain amount of loss, but also a certain amount of evolving and growing and also thriving despite these losses. And people need to be um, have that same capacity for vegetative losses and vegetative gains and to say, okay, I'm going to cut my losses. I'm going to try and I'm going to close my door on that. That didn't work out. And I'm going to open a new one and try and grow in a different direction. And there are so many opportunities for rebirth and um, rec recreating our identities and restarting who we are and, and writing another page, writing another chapter, writing another story to our lives, having yet another adventure. And if things go wrong and things don't pan out, yes, it's horrible, but you can always start again. And so this insistence that there's one fairy tale, and that one fairy tale must work out at all costs and one must defend it with bullets is absurd. Certain things aren't going to last. There are going to need to be times to start over and to come up with a new fairy tale and to work again in pursuit of that. Life is a way of pruning the living, and we can see that pruning as guidance to a better version of ourselves. If we can do that, we can one fine day, we may find that we can influence the real world in a real way starting from the way it is and where, where it is and where we are, not from a position that is fiction, 
of a world that doesn't actually exist and we aren't in that world to begin with. It's when you live in an authentic way like that that reality eventually crashes through and that then is catastrophe because you never learned to adapt, to change, whether you've decided to take that change upon yourself or it's forced upon you. Does that make sense? Thank you for listening to this final episode and I hope to see you next time.